and we call it the iPad. Ten years ago today, Steve Jobs announced a third category of device in the middle. Something that's between a laptop and a smartphone. Something that had to be better at browsing, email, photos, video, music, gaming, and ebooks. Something that had to be the iPad. I'm Rene Ritchie, and this is Vector. On January 27, 2010, Steve Jobs took the stage at an Apple special event to give what was, once again, one of the most important keynotes of his life and in the history of consumer electronics. The Mac had been introduced decades before, the iPhone only a few years, but now Jobs would make the argument for a third category of device. Better at these kinds of tasks than a laptop or a smartphone. Otherwise, it has no reason for being. The company had been working on it since even before the original iPhone. It had gone from a device that could go anywhere to being put on a shelf while Apple worked on a phone-sized version to being just a big iPod touch to two dock connectors and keyboard modes to what Jobs finally showed off on stage. During the keynote, Jobs set up the requirements that it couldn't just be more, it had to be better. Now, some people have thought that that's a netbook. The problem is, netbooks aren't better at anything. <laughs> then he picked up the iPad, sat down in a classic Le Corbusier LC3 chair, yes, right there in the middle of the stage, and proceeded to demonstrate and take absolute delight in the interface and all the apps everyone on the iPad team had sprinted, now countless times in a row, to get ready just in time. I had this idea of being able to get rid of the keyboard, type on a multi-touch glass display. Steve Jobs wanted a single piece of glass he could use to read email anywhere. A safari pad of sorts. That was the brief. That led to the beginning of PEP, the Purple Experience Project, or just Purple, because back then projects had color names. Steve hated this guy at Microsoft. And he just like shoved it in Steve's face the way they were going to like rule the world with their new tablets, with their pens. And Steve came in on Monday, and, uh, and there was a set of expletives, uh, and, and then it was like, let's show them how it's really done. It started out as a massive surface table-sized proof of concept. It was literally a ping-pong-sized multi-touch display. But Jobs wasn't impressed. He needed something he could sell. So Apple's design team tossed around the idea of a Mac-based tablet, but that had its own design challenges, not the least of which was hardware costs that would make it prohibitively expensive. So they went back to multi-touch. The cool thing was, was the ideas were going, the brainstorming, and then and they were bringing up the hardware platform, I guess, with uh, the multi-touch. Uh, right. The, the, the touch pads from Fingerworks. He called me back a few weeks later and he had inertial scrolling working. When I saw the rubber band inertial scrolling and a few of the other things, I thought, oh, my God. But by then, the decision was made to bring the technology to market, not as a tablet, but as a phone. What will cannibalize iPod sales? And one of the biggest concerns was cell phones. Steve Jobs was never one to mistake the company's products for its business. So he knew Apple would need to replace the iPod with an iPhone before anyone else could. That led to P1, an iPod-based phone project led by the father of the iPod, Tony Fidel. We hadn't seen multi-touch in action, right? Was multi-touch touchscreen actually going to deliver a good enough? And P2, a multi-touch-based iPhone led by the OS X veteran, Scott Forstall. I mean, he said, if you don't start showing me something good soon, I'm going to give the project to another team. Jobs thought P2 would take long enough to come to market that they'd need to release P1 first. But the P2 team was beyond driven, hit many of the milestones first, and eventually the P2 iPhone became the iPhone. The next big task was making an app store, a second big sprint right after the first that was almost just as famously announced at the SDK event in 2008. This is an application we've written to deliver apps to the iPhone. Then, with all that knowledge and experience behind them, pulled the tablet off the shelf, took everything we learned from the phone, and went back to work on the tablet. Now, Jobs believed that Apple needed to deliver products with truly differentiated experiences above and beyond what other companies were even capable of. To do that, Apple needed to control their most critical and important technologies. 
So Apple bought PA Semi and Intricity and eventually more silicon engineering companies. Jobs asked then Vice President of Technologies, Bob Mansfield, to assemble a new platform technologies team inside Apple, a team that came to be led by Johnny Suruji, and they were charged with delivering Apple's first system on a chip alongside the first iPad. Now, schedules are always tight at Apple. They'll sprint flat out until time runs out. Very early on when we were hearing that we were going to ship a tablet form factor, the next thing that, that came out of people's mouths, and, and by people, and, and this is even uh, Steve Jobs at that time too, was that this was going to be, think of it as a, as a very large iPod touch. The, the interesting thing here was that this was a case where Steve was, was arguing for us to do less work. And from the engineering and design side, we were saying, <laughs> well, that's just going to be a terrible product. <laughs> really, we need to do more work. <laughs> you know, and I don't think it was hard to convince him, you know, especially right. after seeing some of these concrete examples that, that we really needed to just rethink the, you know, the, the UI for, for a tablet and, and do the right thing for it. But they still had to implement it. And that was brutal. Henri Lamoureux's iOS team ended up pulling in help from the OS X team again and from Don Melton's Safari team. My particular team got actually really involved in the iPad uh, timeframe because at typical Apple, we were trying to do too many things at once. So we temporarily took over doing some of the apps, actually some of uh, Nitin's apps. Except, of course, for the weather, stocks, calculator, and compass. Those apps, the HI team didn't scale up. Those, they figured, could be left blown up. But ironically, or so the story goes, Jobs had come so far around, he said he wanted them redone with proper iPad interfaces. And there just wasn't any time. And so they didn't ship. Even so, Jobs kept adding to the load. At first, he said publicly, no one wanted to read anymore. Then he called Scott Forstall and Don Melton into his office and asked how long it would take for them to make what became iBooks. The only acceptable answer being, of course, in time for the announcement. Same with changeable wallpapers for the home screen and a host of other paint the back of the fence details Jobs wanted done and able to be demoed by the time he set Sneaker to stage. And also same with the hardware. Up until rather late in the process, the original iPad had two dock connectors, one for portrait, one for landscape. As was so often the case with Steve Jobs, black and white was just one too many options. So the decision was made to ship with the single portrait oriented connector. The same happened with the virtual keyboard. Boss Ording, uh, he came up with a design with uh, that looked more like a laptop keyboard, and I came up with a design that looked more like an iPhone keyboard. And uh, Boss came up with a, a terrific animation to stitch these together. So you could actually change keyboards without changing languages. You could go for a keyboard that had more keys and, and, and then change to another one that had bigger keys. So we thought this was a great idea. And um, then we showed it to Steve. And when he saw these two designs, he looked at me and said, we only need one of these, right? Yeah. So the teams, many of the same people who'd spent most of the last years of their lives launching the iPhone, again, worked through the night and through the holidays. But by 2010, Apple was ready to launch their new tablet, something Steve Jobs said would be the most important product of his life, a life filled with important products. The original iPad, as he introduced it, and of course, as everyone originally made fun of the name, even though few remember or make fun of it anymore now, was codenamed K48 and model number iPad 1,1. It had a 9.7 inch screen at 1024 by 768 pixels and 132 pixels per inch, both for the Wi-Fi only model and the Wi-Fi plus 3G HSPA version. It also packed an 802.11n Wi-Fi, Bluetooth 2.1 plus EDR, and absolutely no camera. And the iPad included Apple's first in-house silicon, the Apple A4, a package on package, system on a chip. It combined a 32-bit, one gigahertz ARM Cortex A8 CPU fabricated on Samsung's 45 nanometer process, which Apple called Hummingbird, and a PowerVR SGX535 GPU, along with a rather anemic 256 megabytes of RAM. It came with 16, 32, and 64 gigabyte storage options and a 25 watt hour battery that let it run for an impressive 10 hours. Like the iPhone and iPod devices of the time, the original iPad could connect to a Mac or Windows PC and charge via the traditional 30 pin dock connector. And it came in whatever color you wanted, as long as the only color you wanted was bead blasted aluminum and black. 
Also, like the iPhones of its generation, the original iPad included an ambient light sensor to adjust brightness, an accelerometer to determine orientation, and a magnetometer, a digital compass, to determine direction and rotation around gravity. And, of course, also like the iPhone back then, it didn't include support for CDMA EVDO Rev A data network compatibility. That meant it couldn't work on Verizon and Sprint. It also didn't include support for AWS bands, meaning that while it could work on T-Mobile's 2G edge network, it couldn't work on T-Mobile's 3G network. Not that it mattered. Once more, like the iPhone, Apple teamed up with AT&T. This time they offered 256 megabytes of data for $14.99 a month and $29.99 for unlimited, and it could be enabled on device and off contract. There was also a physical keyboard accessory, though nothing like the smart keyboards we have today. Still, you could buy and attach it via the dock port in portrait mode. And then there was the price. Well, if you listen to the pundits, we're going to price it under $1,000, which is code for $9.99. And I am thrilled to announce to you that the iPad pricing starts not at $9.99, but at just $499. As Tim Cook and his ops team supply chain prowess had made possible. The original iPad ran iPhone OS, as it was still called back then, specifically iPhone OS 3.2 Wildcat. It had most of the same built-in apps, excluding the weather, stocks, calculator, and compass, but on a grander scale. To enable access to the existing library of App Store apps, Apple also gave the iPad the ability to run iPhone apps. We can run these apps with pixel for pixel accuracy, black boxed in the center of the screen. We can also automatically pixel double and run those apps full screen. Apple also gave developers a couple of months lead time to update their apps for universal compatibility or to create iPad specific apps. And when the iPad launched, an iPad app store launched along with it with thousands of optimized apps ready to download. And to help show developers just what exactly was possible with the iPad, Apple ported over their own iWork suite. Made out of their Vancouver office, it included Pages, Numbers, and Keynote, Steve Jobs' favorite app, and it was amongst the best mobile software anyone had seen up until that point. Kind of the first big test for the iPad is like, you know, how much can we do on here? Like, what can we do in 200, 256 megs? Like, it seems, yeah. now I say that, it seems almost impossible that it was done in that amount of memory, right? Then, in June of 2010, Apple announced that they were going to rename iPhone OS. We're going to take away the phone because... It's on iPads and iPod Touches and iPhones, so we're going to rename it iOS 4. Apex, which added background multitasking to a very few categories of apps, would ship for iPhone first, but then for iPad. 4.2 is going to come a little later this year, and it's all about iPad. It's bringing everything to iPad, iOS 4.1 with its multitasking, its folders, Game Center, HDR photos, everything you saw here, all of it to iPad. Ryan Tong here in front of the Armani Exchange store, one of the hottest fashion lines in the world. We're here, what are you guys waiting for? Uh, the iPad, the Apple Store. The usual crock of tech crackpots dismissed the iPad immediately, of course, just as they had the iPhone before it, even the iPod, and they would the Apple Watch after it. Ironically, after everything Apple had just gone through internally as a big iPod Touch. Still, it wasn't clear from the start that even Apple really knew what to make of the iPad. It was the single piece of glass to read email on, the one Steve Jobs had always wanted. But it could be so much more, even if that much more wasn't quite clear yet. On one level, I have to say, I think this has the potential to uh, challenge the laptop. Joshua Topolsky, former editor-in-chief of Engadget, said the name iPad was a killing word, more than a product, a statement, an idea, and potentially a prime mover in the world of consumer electronics. On a one to five star scale, I give it a solid five. Um, I knew what shortcomings going in, I knew it didn't support multitasking yet, and I know that it doesn't have flash, but everything that I wanted to do and everything I needed it to do, it does very well. This is a good purchase right here. You know, if you got an iPod or an iPod Touch or iPhone, and you just want a bigger screen, then this is what you need. All in all, I'm pretty much an absolute huge fan of the iPad. I love it. I can do pretty much everything that I want to do. 
except to create content, it's definitely not a creation device other than Keynote and Pages and all that kind of stuff. It's really something that's used mostly for consuming, watching videos, surfing the web. For that, it has absolutely changed everything that I do. Yours truly writing alongside Dieter Bone for iMore at the time. The iPad is neither absolute failure nor second coming. It is nothing more or less than Apple's attempt to once again make the computer more personal. What began with the original Apple and Mac and became the Apple II and iMac takes another step forward into the future with the introduction of the iPad. Apple sold over 300,000 iPads on its very first weekend. And by May 3rd, when the Wi-Fi and 3G model shipped, they'd sold 1 million. We have sold over 2 million uh, iPads. Though it would never sell as many as the iPhone, its acceleration at launch was even faster than the iPhones. So Apple had once again done the impossible. After a decade of failed tablet PCs, Apple had made the world's very first successful computer you could hold in your hands. Competitors threw every spec they could immediately at trying to catch up with the original iPad. But little did they know, Apple was closing out 2010 by getting ready to show them and us that technology alone simply wasn't enough with a thinner, lighter, faster iPad 2. As strategies go, it was brilliant, and you can be too. Start with simple drag and drop exercises to get you thinking like a computer scientist about how algorithms are structured. Learn big O, conditionals, loops, arrays, and how to put them together into common algorithms for searching and sorting. It's the new algorithms fundamental course from Brilliant, a problem solving based website and app with a hands on approach with over 60 interactive courses in math, science, and computer science. It puzzles you, surprises you, and expands your understanding of the modern world. And all of Brilliant's courses have storytelling, code writing, interactive challenges, and problems to solve. The best resolution you can make this year is investing in your STEM skills. So go to brilliant.org slash vector and finish your day a little smarter every day. Thanks Brilliant and thanks to all of you for supporting the show. Not just a big iPod Touch, but an iPod Touch gone iMacs. The original iPad was a big approachable window to apps and the web and exactly the tablet the mainstream didn't even know they'd been waiting for. And this was its secret origin. So hit like if you do, subscribe if you haven't already, it really helps out the channel. Project Purple, that bell gizmo, so YouTube will actually tell you when new videos go live, and then hit up the comments and let me know. Was the original iPad your first? If so, what did you think of it? If it wasn't, which iPad was your first? Let me know. Thanks for watching, see you next video.